Could you please begin by introducing yourself and giving us some background about your early life? Yes, my name is Henry Nussbaum. I was born um, near Warsaw in a town named Gerardów, and I was raised most of my life until the war and into the war for a while in Warsaw itself. I was uh, basically educated in Warsaw, and my last uh, education period was uh, the graduation uh, from a school called the Mechanical Gymnasium of uh, Warsaw. It was basically a school uh, supported uh, by the Jewish community. It was a Jewish community. It was a very high standard level of education where um, uh, we were going six days a week to school, um, eight hours a day, at least eight hours a day, that we had four hours practical work, which means shop work and machine work, and four hours theory, which was a very high level. Uh, normally, after you graduate a school like this, you would go to another school, which was called uh, a school named Wawelberg School, and that was a school, an a, a engineering school. But um, th there are two reasons why I did not. First of all, uh, the, bro the war broke out, and the uh, second reason is that uh, I was not sure whether, as a Jew, I'll be able to, or they will allow me to enter the school. So, as uh, when I graduated, and before we were really conscious of the fact that uh, there will be a war, um, there was sort of like a... Um, uh, important moment in my life where I didn't know what I'll be doing next, whether I'll go into the labor force market or um, or whatever, I didn't know. What was your family life like? My family life like was a very close life. Like, uh, life. I had two older brothers and two younger sisters, my father and my mother. My father um, <coughs> excuse me, was in the wholesale food business and this was a business for generations where grand the forefathers were in the same business and apparently they came from Germany and were in this line of business and they emigrated for some reason or another to Poland and they were in the same business until that, until the until war broke out. Um, we were never wealthy people. We uh, there was always sort of like an uncomfortable struggle to maintain uh, a normal way of life, whatever you call normal at that time. But um, my two older brothers were fairly well educated. My oldest brother was six years older than I am. And my older brother from me was three years. So we were three years apart. And so, as far as I remember, my sisters were the same way. I had a three-year younger sister and then a five-year younger sister. And we were a very close with family. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I told you once that uh, well, I felt that this was... It was like a uh, set. I felt that this is a set at that time. The way I felt that the family was in a set that it would be impossible to live without a set like this. Um, my father, I looked like my father. He was a very tall and handsome man. <laughs> Not that I'm handsome, of course. <laughs> But uh, he was uh, considered very, very energetic. The entire family was pretty energetic and pretty enterprising and uh, resourceful, I would say. Uh, there was also anything like uh, wondering what to do, what not to do. There were always some decisions made, and they were made, and we did it. I had a, um, for a short time, I lived in a little town, uh, Girardov, where I was born. We were going, I guess, once or twice back and forth and stayed there. I don't know for what reason, maybe it was economical reasons or whatever, but uh, I was going to a Hebrew school over there till I, till I was um, probably nine years old, and public school. So I was going from seven till nine, public school, and from six till nine, from six years till nine years, I was going to Hebrew school at the same time. So I don't have too much of a Hebrew education, but I do read Hebrew and I little understand Hebrew and I know how to pray in Hebrew and in the house we had a um, 
politically we were uh, sort of like split. My father was a general Zionist. My oldest brother was a revisionist, and uh, uh, he was uh, believing in the uh, in, in the uh, precepts of Jabotinsky and so on. Uh, my older brother and I was in the uh, socialist movement. He was a Bundist, and he was this older brother and I, not the oldest, but the other one. He was extremely sociable fellow. He was extremely well built physically fellow. He was in a uh, in a uh, group in a uh, gymnastic group which was very famous all over Poland. He played hockey, and uh, he was very very strong. He picked both my oldest brother and me picked up on both hands, could lift up. And he was only at that time about 15 or 16 years old. So he he was very well coordinated, and uh, I always liked him because I was his tag along. He always took me with him, until, of course, he started to date girls. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel any anti-Semitism during the years that you were growing up in Warsaw? Yes, there was always, even in a small town. When I was growing up, when I was in a little town even, uh, we were going to a um, school where we had both uh, Jewish and non-Jewish uh, children going to the same school. And I always resented to go to that school because, first of all, it was very far outside the city. And second of all, almost every day we had to go in groups, not to be beaten up by, by the uh, Gentile kids. So, and I resented a lot of my own friends because that's what I was associating with only. Because they were running away and I wanted to stay on with them and, and fight back. But I couldn't stay on with myself. I was running away too and I, and I didn't like it. And what happened in So. Well, we were occasionally we had fights. We were beaten up always because we were outnumbered, and uh, probably we did not have we did not have that spirit of fighting because uh, always parents say that fighting is not for us. We are the people to learn, and not fighting. And in Warsaw it was already a calmer situation as far as anti-Semitism is concerned because we lived in a very nice neighborhood. But it was, I would say, about. 60-40, uh, 60% 40, 60 Jewish neighborhood and 40% non-Jewish neighborhood. And uh, we were going to school, and uh, basically that's what we were concerned about. School, education, and occasional fun. And summertime we were going out to the countryside for about two months, usually, every summer. So we felt the anti-Semitism, of course, and we always looked out for it not to encounter any problems. So we stayed away from places where we knew that we'll be asking for problems if we go there or if we participate in certain activities where it was not, was not the right thing to do for a, for a Jewish boy. <laughs> what were you like during that period? I was... As I said, I was, when I look back, I was very naive. I was basically concerned with my education. And I was basically concerned with my family. And um, I was always wondering what is going to be, what is the outlook, because despite this semi-comfortable uh, feeling that we had in the house, that close association. Uh, there was always like a storm outside. There was always something hanging over us. There was, we were not allowed to do this or go there or buy this or purchase things there or over there. And there was always those restrictions where I felt that something will have to give. And that may be very uncomfortable, very unhappy occasionally. I felt if, uh, if I, for example, even that time, if I had some sort of a talent to do, I don't know whether I'll be able to pursue and uh, cultivate a talent towards some sort of a future. So it was, while it was um, a normal way of life, I felt it was a very subdued and under control and uh, it was like a cloud, like a dark cloud always over us. When did that begin to change? Well, it changed for the worse. It didn't change for the better, of course. Uh, summer 1939, we were on vacation, and at one time 
we got a wonderful thing like a telephone or a telegraph, but we suddenly got word from my father, he was in Warsaw at that time, attending his business, that we immediately come home. And uh, we, al we already at that time heard some rumors about the war. So he arranged for a uh, truck to come and pick up some possessions that we had, and we came back to Warsaw right away. And the war started just a few days later. Now at that time my oldest brother was in the army and we didn't know where he was and we were very very worried about him. What I did the first week in the war, I took a bicycle and I drove down probably must have been about 30 kilometers. I rode down with another friend of mine, not with my other brother, but with another friend of mine. We drove down with a little package that my mother gave me, some food. And I found my oldest brother. He was at that time uh, working at a railroad station with some more soldiers. So they allowed him for a few minutes to go away from, from the activities, whatever he was doing. He came and we sat, we sat for a few moments. I gave him the package. And I told him that we worry about him, that mother sent me. And I went back to, Poland, to Warsaw. Drove back. And then what happened? Well, what happened then is, of course, the bombardment of Warsaw. Daily bombardment, continuous bombardment. And uh, there were our own building where we were, uh, where uh, several bombs dropped. There was one bomb where we lived right here. The one, one bomb dropped right in front of our... We were on the first floor, on the second floor. A bomb dropped right into the uh, foundation, right below us, but never exploded, fortunately. So that bomb was uh, later, as far as I remember, was excavated and removed from that place. But during the war, as the war progressed, my older brother was, uh, was um, transferred with a group of, uh, with probably his regiment, into Warsaw to protect Warsaw, to fight for Warsaw against the Germans. Uh, there was no water and no food. Uh, my older brother, that was not in, uh, in, the, in the army, the two of us were going to the um, to a big river called Viswa, and we were dipping big uh, uh, containers, and we filled up the containers with water, and we traveled probably, I would say we walked about three or four miles back home, and carried all that water on us. The same thing with food. <coughs> there were food, there were places where the army left a lot of food. Basically what what they had is in sacks they had sugar and rice somebody broke those doors open and I was one of the first to get in and there and took with me a pillow an empty pillowcase and filled it up with rice and sugar two pillowcases and I made a few trips like this with my brother and with an uncle of mine and that food lasted us for a long long time Somehow we sort of survived on that for, for, I don't know for how long, I can't remember right now for how long, but we had it for a long time. But I think the worst part was later on. What happened is, after uh, the Germans captured Warsaw, my brother, my older brother, one that I was so close with, and I and another friend, we left Warsaw, to the Soviet Union. We went to a small town, Bialystok, which was a part of Poland before the war, now at that time occupied by, by the Russians. And um, I remember we went into a bakery and we sat down at a little table and we didn't know where we were going next. We, we had no place where to sleep. And it was very extremely cold at that time. So the owners of the bakery invited us to their house and all of us slept in one bed. It was very cold inside. 
and the next day we registered to go to the Soviet Union. So they had cattle trains, simply very, very simple, only in cattle trains. We stepped in inside with thousands and thousands of people that left Poland, and they took us to, uh, I don't know how long it took, probably a week or so, until we came to a small town in Belarusia. The town's name was, I think it was called Lazavaya. I'm not sure really. And we stayed there and I worked because I had some training in machinery. I stayed, I worked in a, on a kolkhoz, like it was called, in a machine shop. And my brother was working someplace else at a clothing factory. And we stayed there for some time, and we were very miserable over there. It was very cold and very uncomfortable. We stayed with some very fine Russian family, and they gave us a room to sleep. But that room was built out of boards, and there were spaces between the boards you could see outside. It was so cold. And the only food we had is outside in the shed was laying a dead horse. So every evening when we came back from work, we were cutting away, chopping away with an axe, a piece of that horse, and um, cooking it. I don't know how long it took to cook it. And at night time, I don't know if you pardon my expression, we had to pee right through the wall because it was just horrible to go outside. We it was so cold and right through the wall of the place where we slept. And um, then we decided to escape from there. So we ran away. We ran away about, I don't know, that's about 10 miles from there to another small town. We got on a train. And we had no tickets. So uh, when we, we got on a train, and we smuggled ourselves on a train, and they didn't notice. On the way, the conductor asked us for tickets. We said, we don't have any tickets, and we told them who we are. So he said, all right, I don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about it, and just stay on. And we went, we said, we promised ourselves that we go down to, uh, to Odessa. In our mind, what we read and what we knew, we, we, we thought that Odessa is a warm climate, there's a lot of Jews over there, we'll, live, we'll be like in our own home. But we never came to Odessa. We were stopped in Kharkov. And there we, they took us down, and uh, they sent us again to a, a very small town again. I think the town's name was Izum, something like that. And again, we worked over there for a while. We stayed all together in the Soviet Union about 10 or 11 months, because what happened is there were people constantly coming, and they said, it isn't so bad in Poland. And as a youngster, I missed my family, and so did my brother. So we smuggled ourselves back to Poland. We waded the river, almost drowned in the river. Bug was the name of the river, which was the border between the German part of Poland and the Russian part of Poland. So we waded across, we chopped the ice away, and we got through that river. And we, I know, miraculously, we came back to Warsaw, Poland. That was the time where they started to build walls, and we didn't know what are those walls for. And it was just about the time when uh, Germany declared war against uh, the Soviet Union, when the walls were closed up and we were closed in into the ghetto. That was the most horrible period of my life, that I, one of the most horrible, because there was no place where to get food. The rations was very small. And of course, my father had a lot of, because he was in the fruit business and contacts, we had a lot of contacts outside in the small country, in the countryside. So we were smuggling out. My father had some partners or something where they had a big truck and they had some false papers where we had permission to bring in potatoes and other vegetables into the ghetto. So I was going with my father because 
I don't know, my brothers were someplace else living. One of my brothers were married already, the other one lived someplace else. Oh yes, my older brother became a policeman because of his stature, because he became a, a Jewish policeman in the Warsaw Ghetto. And that was a very short time, and I'll tell you why. He, okay, now I was going quite frequently outside from Warsaw with my father, because my father did, did not look quote, quote, Semitic, neither did I. And we passed as Gentiles, and we were buying uh, all the fru foods, basically, and smuggling it in into Warsaw. The way we were smuggling it in, and when we came in toward the entrance of the ghetto, we showed our false pass, and behind the pass, there was a 50 slotty bill, or some sort of a bill, I don't know, some big bill, where we peeled it off, one went to the German, uh, and one went to the Polak, and the Jewish policeman was the one that arranged it. And we usually found out that sometimes my brother was a policeman there. So he was doing the connection. Now, at one time, at one time, we came in, and the German was not the one that will take the bite, that will not take the money. He tore off my brother's, uh, he had a nameplate or whatever it was, his nameplate, from his chest, and he said, you go home and tonight you have to report to, I don't know exactly where, which he did. And they arrested us. They let me out for some reason or another, I don't remember why, maybe because they thought I'm a minor, but they arrested my, my father. And my father was in jail a long time. I don't know when he got out, because in the meantime, my brother escaped from Warsaw, because he knew if he'll report, he'll be shot or killed or whatever for bribing the German guards. So he escaped. He escaped to a region called Lublin, or Lubelszczyzna, it's called. And in the meantime, there was a tremendous epidemic in Warsaw where I would estimate about at least 30% of, of the population died from typhus. And I myself was sick, got sick and taken to the hospital and my mother, the whole family was sick. And uh, I remember I mentioned once to you that my cousin was a doctor. He graduated in Paris and he was on the staff in that hospital and he was treating me in the hospital and after several weeks I was released from the hospital came home and at the same time my mother and my sisters too but I was uh, very very weak they thought that I'm going to die because I had uh, complications after the typhus when my brain was affected for some reason or another. So I had another uncle. He was a so-called felcher. I know that you heard the expression. Felcher is sort of a doctor, but not a graduated doctor. So he was treating me. And after a while, my brother that escaped from Warsaw, he learned about my sickness. He was apparently very attached to me. So he smuggled back in into Warsaw. He dressed me up and we both escaped from Warsaw. We both escaped from Warsaw and he took me to a hiding place way near Lublin. There we lived with some peasants. They treated us very good. But we had to work on their land for the food, which we didn't mind. And my brother was going back and forth to Warsaw for some other things that we needed too. And he, got, he was caught. And he was put into a um, camp, in a camp or a big jail in Lublin. There was a big, tremendous, awful camp. And later on we learned that he died over there. At that time, my parents knew where I am. My parents, was all, all that was left now is myself, my parents that were in Warsaw. My, my father was somehow released from, 
from jail. I don't know how, how it happened. And he and my mother and my two sisters came to live on that little town. The Germans started to look for young men, so I escaped from there and left only my parents. And uh, I escaped, and I thought I joined a underground. Later on, I found out it was not an underground. It was just a group of criminals. And um, when I joined, they said they are going to teach me how to handle arms, that they are getting their supplies from the Russians or from the English. But I learned that they are not doing anything with the Germans, anything against the Germans. They are attacking pr pr private citizens, taking money of them from them, taking food and, and clothing. And when I, they didn't know that I'm Jewish, of course. And uh, after a few months, the whole group was caught. And they were all, as they were, examining us, I mean, uh, taking our names and so on. When it came to me, I told them, I told the examiner, it was a Polish policeman in a jail. I said, look, I said, I am Jewish, and this is my name. So they put me separately in a different group with other Jews. And um, from there, I was sent to a uh, labor camp called Yanishov. Now, going back, I just keep on reminding myself about the Warsaw. I mean, there are some incidents, like I mentioned to you, Ian, where uh, when sometimes you see, you see an incident where it is a pure reflection of what it really was. Like we had neighbors downstairs, a mother with three or four daughters. They were very refined, lovely people. And the way those people in Warsaw sustained themselves is they were selling their clothing. They, get, they were getting to the wall, to the wall were separating. They were throwing over their clothing and people, the Gentiles were throwing uh, back some pieces of uh, food, uh, bread or whatever it is. And apparently, and we were doing the same thing for a while because there was no place where to live from, what to live from. And once we found that family, we walked into that place, the door was completely open and the rooms were completely empty except there was what it was is a uh, remnant of a bed but it was just the frame of the bed, big bed and those boards are cross and there was that mother with the four girls laying almost completely naked and dead This is something that will never leave my mind and my memories. And uh, of course being in Warsaw, still back to Warsaw, the only way we maintain our lives is, I used to jump, jump the, um, um, the wall and uh, be able to uh, sell things or purchase food and come back, or sometimes sleep in a park, sleep in a park overnight, just to have more time to be over, on the other side. And I witnessed awful things. The Germans were bringing in people from little towns and compressing them all into Warsaw. And seeing people, families, fathers and mothers, with their little children holding their hands. And I stood nearby, of course, and the father's looking around saying, what is going on, why is that? But the children looking at their parents say, Papa, wh wh where are we going? What are we doing here? And the father has nothing to tell him. I sort of fell when I looked at those faces. I see what's going on how horrible it is with children, there's no answer to them. You cannot tell them anything. That father cannot tell them anything. Those children were always ready to find an answer from their parents, but there was nothing to them to tell them. 
those incidents will never leave me in my life. Where were we? We were back to where they put us into a camp. It was a horrible labor camp. It was a camp where we worked half naked every morning, digging irrigation ditches where thousands of leeches were just stuck to your body and you just have to constantly fight them and pull them off your legs and for any little transgression or non-compliance people were shut. This was a camp where one evening it was a camp coincidentally run by one or two Germans and a few Polacks and uh, one night a group of two underground people came and killed a German and shot his helpers and they took all the boys out. We were about 200 men, boys, teenagers, most of us. And he said, you have to run away and find your own place where to go. And this was the underground. There were a few from the underground, they were wearing Polish uniforms still. There's even one of the underground people lives here, right here, in, uh, in Los Angeles. His name is Kam. And he knows he was one of the people, and but they couldn't take us all. So he said, "You just have to find your own groups, organize your own groups, do whatever you can." But there was no place where to go. That was the first time where we stayed and we didn't know what to do because there was no place where to run. And in the evening, next evening came a a German outfit with machine guns. They assembled us all in one group and I just, you know, everybody says to himself, well, I guess this is it. Somehow, as far as my personal concern, I, I never heard anybody crying or screaming or shouting. And personally, I said I was very calm for some reason or another. Maybe I was oblivious of what will happen and at the same time I knew what will happen but at the same time maybe I felt relieved because I felt that my parents will not see my end neither will I see their end incidentally the same sort of a feeling I had in the Warsaw ghetto where I once volunteered to go out and volunteered to a, to a camp. And when I came, the people that were uh, organizing that group, one of them was a former teacher of mine. He did not accept me. He said, go home. And later we learned that the entire group was vanished. Did you know of the deportations? Pardon me? Did you, did you know when you were in the Warsaw Ghetto of the various deportations? And when I was in the Warsaw Ghetto, I left before all the deportations. When I was in the Warsaw Ghetto, people were coming in from outside little towns and areas. They were squashing us in, squeezing us in. Okay? There were 10, 20 people to one room. People were laying on the streets and dying. What we did is there was, when you walked out on the street, there were people laying constantly. All you do is just cover them with paper. And um, that was Warsaw. Um, going back to the camp, I don't know whether it was a miracle or whatever it is. Not far from that small camp was a large camp called Budzin. That was a camp built right next to a great big factory, a German factory called Heinkelwerk. 
they were building components and whole airplanes or part of airplanes, wings, engines and so on. And apparently they needed people. So they transferred the entire group, they transferred to that camp. And in that camp, this was another one of the horrible camps. There was one commander over there, and when I came there, it was, he was called Fikes. As far as I know, he was executed later after the war. But he, there was daily, daily numerous executions, just for no reason. I remember one execution, which I didn't know wh why and what is going on, but they woke us up three o'clock in the morning. Everybody must get dressed. And that was the first time I witnessed a selection, and I didn't know why, what was that. And uh, we were marching through a, um, the camp doors, gates, I should say, I should rather say. And there was standing fikes with a long um, whip. And whoever he wanted out, he hit him over the head. And he had to step out. Usually, he did it to short people, to skinny people, to people that look sickish or whatever. I don't know how he saw it because it was still dark, almost dark, sort of twilight. And he pulled out, out of 600 people, he pulled out about 180 people. We went to work. When we came back, the people that, rem that, that usually work in camp, like the cooks and the uh, local police and so on, they told us what happened. They shot everybody. And uh, they shot all those people. And the way they described it was a horrible thing because they made very shallow graves and those graves were still moving up and down after two, three hours of, of, of shooting those people. This camp, in this camp I got acquainted with a man who was Jewish but he was Gentile. In other words, he portrayed as a Gentile. He was like a contracted Gentile worker that will come in to the, not to the camp, but to the factory, pardon me. They were, so at, at a certain time, the factory, the people from the outside, the Gentile workforce were coming into the factory and we were marching in from the camp to the factory. We were marching about, I would say a mile and a half or two miles. And we, I don't know why, as I mentioned to you before, you looked at faces and sort of, I sensed that this man is not what he portrays to be. And we took a liking to each other. And he told me, his name was Markovsky, but actually his name was Lieberman. He lives now in Israel. He's a very good friend of mine now. Unusual fine man. Very smart and he helped me. Since I was fairly aggressive, there were a lot of people coming into the camp in Budzin with money, but didn't have any food. Well, he became my contact. Okay. He was, I was transferring to him some monies, and I was getting some for it, and he was bringing food, and I was transferring food to the, to the camp, and so on. Once, they brought a small group of remnants from Warsaw. And uh, I learned of one man who was a big personality within the Jewish community center. His name was, I don't know. Anyway, he has, he told me in confidence that he has buried in the, um, he has buried in, uh, in the cemetery, a big box 
with treasure, big treasure box. But since I had some technical background and know-how, I made a map and I gave this map to Markovsky and um, he said that he's having a uh, vacation or something in a few weeks and he's going there. This was a hair-raising story because he took that map and he went to Warsaw. In Warsaw, on the cemetery, there was a, a Gentile gang roaming around, opening up caves, pulling out dead people and pulling their gold teeth out. That was their activity. And whoever interfered with their activity was killed immediately. And I told him, I told my friend Markovsky about it. He said, don't worry about it. When he went to Warsaw, he met a friend who sold him a gun. I also gave him an input about that man, Rabbi Posner was his name. That's right, Rabbi Posner was a man that talked to me. And Rabbi Posner had a nephew hiding out on the cemetery. His name was Yurek. And I said, look, you have to find that Yurek who will help you find that place. And um, certainly enough, he went to the cemetery. He was armed. And through some miraculous, I don't remember the details, whether it was some calling to whistling or whatever, that they found each other, both of them. And this Markovsky found that big treasure, a very big treasure he found out. I don't remember what it was over there. And he brought it back. He handed the whole thing over to me. And I brought it back to, I really risked my life because anything you bring back to the camp was, was very risky. We handed everything over to this man, Posner. And he, of course, divided it through some people. And he was so sort of like buying things for himself, all the comforts of, uh, of things that can be bought from outside through an intermediary, which I was the one. So this, this was a very important uh, period in my life because as a result of my activities, um, at that time too, the Germans were bringing in uh, German descendants from Russia. They were Germans but of Russian descent. They spoke Russian and German. There was one man who constantly was observing me, and I don't know, maybe he caught on to something. But one day, one day he came over to me, and, I sa and he says to me, give me all your money you have. And I had nothing on me. I hid it. So he took a piece of wood. I remember I was standing next to a wall. He hit me right over the head here. So I lost my conscience, and I sort of slid down. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but when I woke up, he stood over me, and he hit me a few times over the face, and he said, you have to give me all your money. I said, I'm not going to give you anything because I haven't got anything. I knew if I give him, I'll be dead, and I sort of felt this way I'll be dead too, probably, because what he did is when we marched back to the camp, and incidentally, every time we came to them, there were some people hanging or some people were shot or something. So when we came back to camp, he walks into the camp too. And he goes over to the fikes. And he points his finger at me and two more other people. That we are smuggling, we are doing a lot of business, and we have money, and he wants him to know about it. So naturally... I said to myself, this is it. So that Fikes pulls us all out. And he lines us up, three or four of us. We had a very fine commandant, Jewish commandant of our, of our camp, Buzin. His name was Stockman. He was an officer in the Polish army, still was wearing his uniform. And he came over to us and he said, do you have anything to say? 
So I said, yes, I can tell you one thing, that he is trying to blackmail us. We don't have any money, but he's blackmailing us. He wants to, he wants to just try to get our money out. So he says, to me, I'm going to tell this to Fikes. So he went over to the German Fikes, who was ready to kill us right then and then. And he, he bent over to him because he was extremely tall, maybe six and a half, seven foot. He bent down to the German Fikes in a very cool manner. And from far away, I saw him, he was talking about it. And I saw that German Fikes got red in his face. He turned around and he hit that Russian German over his face and said, get out of here. But he still, that Fikes did not just let us go. We were left in camp, even though the whole group was going a few days later, I mean, the next few days, going back to work. We were left in camp for further investigation, apparently. Now, since when I worked in the, um, in the shop, the German master, was a very likable man, and he liked me too. We did all sorts of very special things for him. Very good, uh, very fine work for him personally and for the, for the shop itself. So what I heard later is that that fights, that murderer, talked to him a few times, and apparently he gave a very good opinion of me and others. So a few days later we were let go we were allowed to go to work. At that time, I decided to escape from that camp. And that Markovsky smuggled in a, um, a, photo, uh, a, um, camera. a camera. And I remember the only place we took, we could take a camera is, if you pardon me express, in the toilet. My, another friend of mine walked in into the toilet. I sat right above the bowl. The walls were white, of course. So I snapped some pictures. The camera was for the purpose of, the, of making for me a, uh, a passport, some, not passport, an ausweis, an ID, identification, ID. And um, I handed over that camera with the film inside to Mr. Markovsky at that time. And I said, you get me ready clothing, and I'll let you know how I'm going to escape. I had some sort, something on my conscience, because I knew every time anybody escapes, they pull out a few people and kill them for it. So there was a very big sort of internal fight with me. Here I knew that sooner or later we're all going to be killed, or I'll be killed by something, or there's a chance to get out and maybe escape and maybe survive. And during that period of hesitation, there was already the, Markovsky said, I have the pictures ready for you, I'm making right now your ID, I have prepared already because he liked me very much, I have prepared for you the clothing, you just tell me when. And just between that period, we were all transferred to another camp right a few miles away, it was called the Budzin KL. Concentrationslager. In the meantime, before that happened, sometimes I have to, I feel sad about it, because I never was beaten by a German during the whole war, by coincidence. The only beating that I got is that hitting from that uh, Russian German and by the Jewish police inside the, inside the, uh, the camp of Putin. They too, when they, they learned that I am doing a lot of dealings with some old people. One day they kept me back, one day or two days, I know, they kept me back in the camp and they were trying to um, blackmail me and get all or whatever money I have, and I wouldn't give it to them. That was the first time that I had eyes, bloodshed eyes, for months. This sort of a beating I got. And I knew them all. They were all, 
I shouldn't say that, but I have to tell you the truth. They were all religious people, semi-religious, or former religious people, whatever. This is where sometimes I feel that, and how disappointed I am sometimes in, in humanity itself, that it could happen to any people. Anyway, that was my own time. I was a beating where my eyes were so small, s swollen that I couldn't even look to them for months. But after I was transferred to that other camp, I still had some swollen eyes. I was sort of courted by a group of those policemen trying to apologize for what they did. They really did say it was very hard to apologize for some reason. I know that everybody was so hardened. They were really apologizing and trying to apologize for what they did. But that was a fairly good camp because that's all I can remember is they gave us, that was the first time where we had to take off our clothes, our civilian clothes, which was marked in the back, KL, uh, no, it was marked in the back with a uh, star or whatever, and they gave us the blue and white stripe uniforms. That was the first time. And the first time I felt some more at ease because we had sort of like a good relationship with the um, German soldiers and officers because there was our camp and there was the border and there was on the other side there were the German officers and we talked to each other across. Once in a while we were punished for some reason or they took us in the middle of the night out and stood for hours in the rain and um, snow and whatever and we stood and shivering and those Germans came out and started to holler and scream at the SS men why they let us stand there. They called them murderers, they called them all sorts of names. But relatively it was a fairly good camp. What we were doing is, uh, because I, I think apparently they selected, they did make a selection at that time too, but left all the people that had mechanical backgrounds or whatever we were supposed to repair tanks that were coming back from the German, from the uh, Russian front. And on numerous occasions, the officers gave us food and told us to take it easy, not to rush too fast to fix those tanks. And many times, those officers took, we saw them that they were doing awful things. They were dropping in all sorts of, in the transmission, they were dropping in nuts and bolts and so on so that when they left they came back and said something still is wrong so they could remain with their equipment but this this lasted about a half a year from there we were transferred to a camp in Radom city named Radom that was a fairly good camp because it's sort of when we came into the camp we saw entire families almost being together from the town Radom and we met some very fine interesting people and personally for me I came with a lot of money over there and some of those people wor were working outside so you could find the most luxurious food inside the camp for a while what year was this? That was 42, what end of 42 or what 43. What do you mean by luxurious food? Like uh, drinks, cognac, uh, all sorts of uh, salamis. I mean, I've never seen it before. But here yeah, I could buy it, and I did for a while. What happened, there was a group of people were working outside, outside the camp. and. Apparently the smuggling was pretty easy. The guards were not rough, either they were, uh, maybe they were bribed or whatever. I did not know the intricacies inside. And, uh, and um, so that was for a while, it was fairly good. And I worked in a factory at a uh, turret lake, it was called, where we were making tools. 
and um, this lasted. I'm too bad. I'm not too good in estimating time, but I think it lasted about eight or nine or, or a half a year or so, until the entire camp was liquidated, and they made us march. We were marching. It was summertime, probably summer 40, 43. We were marching for miles and miles and miles, several days and several nights, until we came to a town. It was groups, I mean, thousands of people, probably about, we were probably about three or four thousand people. And that's the first time where I saw again, horrible thing, whoever couldn't march was shot to death. What they were doing is whoever couldn't march, they left me and then they said that we are going to put you on a, uh, on a wagon. They did put them on a wagon, but after the wagon stayed behind, they killed them. We came into a uh, big, at that time, we already started to sort of feel that this was coming to an end. There was some information filtering through uh, how the people are being killed in Treblinka and in, uh, and in Auschwitz, and uh, there was and all around us, we said, well, where is everybody? I mean, there's nobody else left. Are that just us here? So they marched us on to a place named Tomashov. And there was a very narrow entry to a giant hangar. And there again we said to ourselves, ah, ah, this is the end. This is where they are going to gaze us or kill us or whatever. And everybody was horrified. And uh, the, the, the Jewish leadership, whatever it was, stood at the entrance and they were sort of calming us up, calming us. Don't worry, don't worry, everything will be okay, in this sense of, of words. And the Germans seemed to be calm too. And as we walked in, we saw the walls were written all over with Jewish names. Uh, Jack Horowitz was here. Uh, you know, I mean thousands and thousands of names. I mean the, all the walls. Just like living a testimony of whatever there was after that. And people just sat down on the... There was nothing in it. Just concrete uh, floors and those concrete walls on both sides and very tiny windows and I heard crying people start calm not hysterical but calm crying there were with us women and men from Radom and there were some youngsters too there were some I think there were some youngsters 10, 11, 12 year olds, and there were older people too. And I think what happened, not this, not this walking into that place, but all those names made at least me feel, and others too, when we look, when we start reading that, that's sort of like a, um, like a written cemetery. These were once people, but well, they are no more. I guess they left us there, they gave us some food and uh, something to drink. And a day or so later, there was a siding. They brought up some wagons, a um, cattle train came up and we were all pushed in into the train. Sorry to interrupt. Throughout Going back to that place in Tomashov, where they put us inside, as I mentioned before, there were names, but I, I saw messages on it, messages to my father, to my brother, to my wife, long and short messages, and that sort of, I didn't put any messages on it myself, because I did not want to know my parents or my brothers or my sisters, would they alive?
when they come here that I was here too. And I didn't know that feeling in me, that I had that relief in me, that they don't know what happens to me and I don't know what happens to them. I think throughout the entire time, you, you wanted to be with them and yet you, I was glad that I wasn't with them because they will not witness, or I will not witness, or we will not witness each other's end, or the treatment that we get, or what happens to us. Anyway, that train took us directly to Auschwitz. We were all loaded up on those trains in Tomaszów, and we went straight to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, I had a very hazy idea of what was going on in there, because I remember distinctly, I looked out through the window, and I saw one part where I saw people, like disfigured people, walking without a shoe, or, and we were fairly dressed, even though we, were, we had those uniforms, the blue and white uniforms of Kael, they were dressed in such a horrible, grotesque way that I asked my friend, what do you think this is? And he says to me, it must be a crazy house here. So then I say, what are we doing here? Maybe we are crazy too. There was no answer. But pretty soon, there was an abrupt opening of the, of the doors of the train. And they asked us to strip us, to strip down until just upper part, all our shirts and everything stripped down and go outside. And um, we, I don't know whether we walked or whether we stood and the Germans passed by. I don't remember the faces of the Germans. All they did is they asked us to lift our hands up like this to see how well we are built or whether there is still meat on us, apparently whether we are physically strong and they were pulling out people. They were pulling out youngsters, they were pulling out old people, and they were pulling out people that apparently looked anemic or sick or weak or whatever. Excuse me. And they asked us to get in back inside the wagons. And that was the extent to my, to my Auschwitz experience, fortunately. From there they took us directly to Germany, to a town named Weihingen, not too far from Stuttgart. It was a horrible camp. They were building over there factories on the ground. And we all had to crawl right inside the ground and bring out big boulders on our heads. Whoever brought a small one not only was beaten up and hit, but he had to drop this one, go again, and bring out a bigger one. That was a horrible camp. Fortunately, I was taken out from there again to a group where they needed some machine work or whatever, some people oriented in machinery. And I worked in a machine shop briefly. And um, there I met there was a German master again who really helped me. What he did is, uh, even though he was afraid, he left some food in his canister. And he, uh, every lunchtime he says, go wash my canister out. He, and I told me uh, in a very strict way, wash it out. And I knew he left over there some food. So I ate that food and I washed it out, brought it back to him. This must be moving towards the end of the toward war. Toward the end, now. yes. This is already towards the end. Is that where you were liberated? No. There were two more camps where I was real fortunate. There was one camp where I was selected to be a cook. For some reason I presented myself straight and up and washed my shoes out in, in water and they, they were nice and clean. And the German pulled me out, myself and a few more, and they took us into the, uh, to the kitchen and said, you are going to be the cooks. And there we were a few months, very well treated, naturally being a cook. 
and uh, we were trying to help as many as possible. As a matter of fact, there are people here that could testify that uh, there, were, there were some people who came to me and said they are going to pull out their gold teeth to give me if I can give them food. I said, I don't need your gold teeth. You just come around to my barrack and I'll give you food. And they live here, they know me. And um, from there we were sent to Allah Dachau, where we stayed a few weeks. And there, uh, there was really mis misery. There was absolute misery. And from there we were put on another train. That train was supposed to take us to the Tyrol Mountains, into the mountains, and we were supposed to be shot. So our convoy was met by Swiss Red Cross people. That's what, what I know. And the Swiss Red Cross people persuaded the, the German commander to let us be, to let us stay where we are, and they will testify on his behalf that he has done all he could to save us. And that's what happened. There was a few days we saw American tanks passing by, and the German guards throwing their arms away and running into the forest. And uh, we just jumped out from the trains, and not looking back, we started to walk towards the uh, American uh, tanks that were going by. And I just remember Polacks screaming and shouting uh, from Pennsylvania, and we talked to them, and they threw us cigarettes and chocolate from the tanks as we walked towards uh, a town called Weilheim, where we settled. What was that like? It was like, I, th I don't know what to say. It was... Well, it really started, I think there was some sort of a positive mood started when we were, when we left Allah Dachau. We had a German commander, where as we walked by, he was saying, keep your head high, Kopf hoch, to almost to everybody that was passing by. And we were wondering, what, what, what's going on here? So we walked into that, into that uh, train, not afraid anymore. Of course, we were, not, we were completely oblivious of what, what could have happened. And uh, there was straw so we can lay down. We sat for a few days without any food, uh, but all we did, we talked about food. There was one man who was telling him how his father, Buche, was bringing the food. And we were sort of feeding ourselves on the conversation about food. I was talking about fruit because our house was always full of fruit. He was talking about meat. And that's how we passed our time. And then we were singing uh, some... Jewish or religious songs, I think, were singing. We didn't know who is in the next wagon. We just knew it this year. And the uh, guards were fairly mild. They were old people, old guards, you know, called up. So there was, I don't know why, we had an optimistic feeling. All I know, there was with us a man who, who worked for the 20th Century Fox Studio. He was a Jew, but he was sent from the United States to represent and he was, was caught in the whole theater. And when we got out of there, and there was, they say, freedom, freedom, we all go. He suddenly completely collapsed. Completely collapsed. And we were starting to run. We, I said, my friend and I, and two more friends. One of them was so hungry, he started to eat anything, and a few days later he died. There were a lot of people who died after we survived. I don't know. There was a sort of an anti-climatic anti climate. It was a, um, something that we expected a few days. Maybe the whole thing came so slowly to us. And uh, it was something that I didn't want to look back. Just running away from Sodom and Gomorrah sort of. Just run forward, run, run away from where you were. Go someplace. And we were running, really running. And we came to that little town. 
And that, that was interesting too because we came to the town and we didn't know where to go, so we went up to the uh, city hall. Uh, we say to the uh, to the man who was sitting at the desk, he said, "We need a room and clothing." So he says, "We don't have anything. Don't you see? It? No, it's a war." So he's telling us that uh, where is a war. So it was interesting when we walked out. There's a German, as a American officer comes up, comes up. He looks at us, and I say to him, uh, "Oh, my friend says Amcho." You know what is the word Amcho? So he says, yeah, like in German. So he says, I am Lehman, he says to me. I am a former German Jew who lived in, in America, and I am now a dolmetscher. I am, and he was a colonel, he was a very high officer. So he says to us, what are you doing here? So I say, so my friend and I say, we, we want to live someplace. We don't have food, we don't have shelter, nothing. So he says, come with me. He, go up, he went up with me, I mean, he went up with us, Lehman. He took his pistol out and he hit it on the, on the table. And he says, you're going to be dead in ten minutes if those people, really he said it, if those people don't have a place to live and some shelter. This German pulled out a drawer and he writes out two tickets. He gives us a, an address where to go. He gives us another address. It was a uh, big department store, closed up of course, so he tells us how to get in, in there, on the back. So we go in, in there. Department's person's name was Nussbaum, two, uh, with two S's. So I say, hi, I'm Nussbaum too. Ach, no Liebe, he said, I didn't know what was going on. Right away they were trying to excuse themselves how they didn't know what is going on. Anyway, he supplied us with clothing, fair amount of clothing, not too much, there was not too much to choose from, but we had something. And then we went and we were located at a very fine German family. And just a few days later, they organ there was a lot of Jewish refugees keep kept on coming in, and they organized a place. We organized a place. It was uh, like a hotel called Breivastel. I think so. Where there was a restaurant where we can, could come and eat our meals. We organized right away uh, activities. Um, we organized uh, a committee. And uh, we were just starting to function again. We started to uh, organize uh, classes for Hebrew, uh, classes for English. And uh, there were. Uh, a variety of uh, great things were happening. We were getting some people from the United States that were visiting us, some actors and some uh, writers and, uh, and uh, some people from the Joint Distribution Committee came, tried to give us some food. And we were going on like this, sort of hanging in a limbo, not knowing what's going on. Did you try to find your family at that point? Yes. Uh, this happened uh, just a little bit later, where the UNRWA tried to um, uh, organize and uh, try to find out uh, who we are and what we are. And uh, what I did is I, where we lived, the German lady helped me to type a two-line English letter. I wrote one to the UNRWA, to the Red Cross, and one to the to the Joint Distribution Committee. <clears throat> Just wrote a few words. My name is so-and-so, I am from Warsaw. I have family in Detroit. His name is Jack Newman. And I have uh, an aunt in, the, in New York whose name was uh, Bronya Brownstein. I don't know what's her present name. By marriage, or Bronya Newman, her maiden name. And certainly enough, after a few weeks, I have a... Um, I have a, uh, an American officer knocking at my door and presents himself to me and says, my name is Yannick, whatever. Yannick, I said, suppose you say, yes, I'll tell you a story. Yes, I am a friend of your aunt from New York, Bronya's friend. Well, I nearly fell down and... and yeah. 
We have to be concluding at this point. Whatever I'm, you want to. I'm, I'm wondering if there is like just one something extra that you either want to get across or you want to, to share. Well, I think the only thing across I would like to share with you is that um, despite all the horrors, there is something in us positive. I don't know whether it is in all humanity, whether it was in those that survived, that, um, that made us look forward, made us see that there is still a world to live for and to live in with all the horrible things uh, I now think that it is worthwhile surviving because by the message that some of us can transfer to other people maybe we'll learn how to how our world can conduct their affairs, how our governments can, ca can conduct their affairs, how to avoid any repetition to anybody of what happened to us. Because for a while I really was very pessimistic. Maybe I mentioned to you, when I learned, when I survived of the United Nations, I was so enthused about it at one point and at another point I wanted to write to them and say, let's come out with a slogan no more children because if there will be no more children there will be no more slaughter of them thank you very much